welcome to episode 197 of the Cricket Her Weekly. Breaking news, Sid, to begin with. Literally. Literally. <laughs> Sorry, Alyssa Healy. But we've just found out that she has done herself an injury at home. Um, there is currently no explanation as to exactly what happened, but she's posted a photo on Instagram of her with a bandaged hand and there's a splint in there as well. So there seems to be a suggestion that she's somehow broken it. Um, and this is bad news, obviously, for WBBL because she is likely to be out of the whole of WBBL. Um, but also Australia are going to India on a tour in December, which is not that far away, about six weeks away. And yeah, it looks like she might be out for that as well, potentially. Well, that's all right, Raph, because Beth Mooney can keep wicket. Yeah, yeah, that's what you said to me this morning when I presented you with this news. And I said, yes, Sid. But what about the captaincy? Oh, <laughs> oh dear, Australia. Yes, oh dear. Um, because there is no if suggestion... you've made some preparations for this eventuality. <laughs> because there is no suggestion that Meg Lanning will be um, potentially even going on the tour, let alone ready to captain on the tour again. Alyssa Healy has been her stand-in and it has been a kind of way, as we've talked about, of then dodging the actual long-term succession issue in terms of who's going to be um, the next kind of full-time long-term captain of Australia. Well that's a decision they're going to have to confront potentially quite soon. Yeah I mean and I guess it would be Talia McGrath she's currently captaining in WBBL and you know she's been the vice captain but you know it does as you know if only if only the administrators of Cricket Australia watched the Cricket Her Weekly they'd have seen months ago that what they should have done was the proper succession against planning. Pakistan given Talia McGrath the opportunity to captain in the T20s against Pakistan or something and then they wouldn't be going in you know to India with someone that's never done it at this level before. Wow. Hey ho. Yeah Nick Hockley. The moral of this Nick is Nick Hockley watch the needs to get weekly. on watching the Cricket Her Weekly. <laughs> Okay, anyway, anyway, we obviously yeah, wish Alyssa Healy all the Alyssa best. Alyssa Healy, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, and hopefully she'll be back, you know, ASAP. And it's definitely possible she could be back. You know, sometimes these things look worse than they are. True. But, it does look pretty bad, but yeah. you never know. Okay, so let's talk about WBBL, Sid, um, because it's on us again. It's mid-October. That means it's WBBL time. And excitingly, we actually get to watch quite a lot of it from the UK. Um, some of the games do happen in the middle of the night. We woke up this morning to find that Grace Harris overnight has had quite an exciting few hours. Well, more breaking news, because she literally broke a bat. Ah, very good. Faced the next four with a broken bat, hit it for six, then the bat smashed completely. Imagine being so good that you're able to hit a six with a broken bat. I just It's just beyond the realms of my existence. Um, 136 or 59 balls. Just a ridiculous innings. Um, yeah, I did wake up a, a few times in the night. I thought it was because of you snoring, Sid, but actually I think it was because I could hear ball on bat by Grace Harris 10,000 miles away. Anyway, um, great innings for her, and it has been quite a, an eventful start to WBBL. Um, but let's begin with um, a few comments that have been made recently um, by a few international players or Australian players. Um, who have actually been a bit critical of the length of WBBL, which is really interesting. So we're, we're now up to, it's kind of steadily crept up over the years, hasn't it? We are now up to a full 14, se 14 match season where every team plays everybody else home and away. So that's where we're at at the moment. But the cool is um, that potentially next year it should be reduced down now to being a 10, a 10 match competition. Yeah, this is an interesting one, isn't it? Um, the, the international players obviously want this because they feel they, um, you know, they already play a lot of cricket. Yeah. I mean, I think that if you talk to any domestic players, they will not be so keen because, of yeah. course, the WBBL, if you're a domestic player, uh, you know, or even if you're a sort of very fringe international player, like an Amanda Jade Wellington, you know, this is your one chance to shine, you know, in front of your home mm -hmm. public and things if you're not, not, not playing a lot of games for Australia. So the domestic players will definitely want it to, to keep being you know, the, the kind of couple of month, 14 game competition. I'm not massively keen on the idea of a 10 game competition either. I think that it kind of reduces the sporting integrity of it. You know, if I were to say to you, you know, that, that for instance, the next, the next Cricket World Cup, you know, we'd have an extra round. So we'd have everyone plays everyone else and then an extra round where some, where, you know, each team plays their local rival twice. So yeah. England would play Ireland twice. Australia would play New Zealand twice. India would play Pakistan twice. Yeah. Um, you know, so if, in, I see, if I suggested that, you'd go, no, that's, that's, quite not, well. that's not fair. <laughs> yes. 
Um, Correct. And yet we are kind of, we appear to be suggesting that, that this is a good idea for WBBL. What do you think, Raf? Well, it is something that we see in other franchise competitions, isn't it? So yeah, it's currently the like, case in the 100. I don't like it in the 100 either. Because okay, like, in the 100 at the moment, you effectively have everybody plays each other once and then there's one extra game where um, it's like a, a local derby. Which is your derby. local derby. So, yeah, so know, um, I think... If you're in Southampton, you get to play Cardiff in your local local derby. Well, yeah, local-ish. Mm. Local-ish derby. It's like, it'll be local <laughs> in Australia. It'll be very local That's in true. Australia. Um, so that means the, the Welsh Fire always have to play the Southern Brave, who have been a very successful team. Um, and so there have been kind of rumblings, and you've certainly expressed your dislike of this on the grounds that it's unfair. Um, so if we're going to reduce WBBL, then we're kind of going down that route again as well. Um, I think it's a bit different to a World Cup. And I was thinking about why I feel that it doesn't matter in the way that a World Cup does. And I guess ultimately it's because I feel like the World Cup is like the true test and the, the big one because it's international teams. Whereas franchise domestic cricket is a little bit more malleable. Um, and I, I feel more comfortable with... Um, with you know the the competitions being kind of different lengths and um, and potentially some teams playing other teams different numbers of times somehow um, I guess as well it's a bit of a balancing act because at the moment the reason why I enjoy watching WBBL is not because I have a massive affinity to a particular team I normally pick the team that like Sophie Devine's playing for for example because I, I pick the team that my favourite player is playing for rather than because I have a massive affinity for one of the teams um, but I, I, I like watching it because I like watching good cricket if you take out a lot of the Australian players as in the Australian international players and then you reduce the number of overseas because they don't want to go because they've got WPL now um, and you can earn a lot more money for a lot less work doing that at the moment then the quality of cricket decreases so you've got a bit of a balancing act going on haven't you between actually potentially it feels like there's a little bit of a, a veiled threat going on of some of the some of this criticism of the length of the tournament people going well actually if you don't reduce it down cricket australia then i might not bother playing um and we did talk about this a bit last year um on the podcast about the length of, of wbbl because we knew that the wpl was coming in and we knew that this was potentially going to get be an issue and we did get a bit of comeback about it from people saying oh wbbl it's the supreme franchise tournament it's the best one it's the biggest one I, well i kind of i still think it is yeah. i still think it's got more sporting integrity because it's a longer tournament you know it's it's a it's a it's a bigger challenge than the wpl but you know if they want to keep that kind of that status as the kind of blue ribbon franchise tournament yeah. because WPL is going to challenge very hard for it and exactly. WPL is going to expand and yeah. WPL will want you know they'll want eight teams yeah. and then they'll want home and away because you know they want to dominate as well and I don't think the way to address this is to you know reduce the number of games to be honest you know but but I think that, that, okay, but then we're at a little bit of a tipping point, aren't we, in terms of player power versus board power. And because the WPL now exists and players like Ash Gardner can go and earn an extraordinary amount of money playing in it for only a few weeks work. Um, actually, they're at a point now where they can turn around and say, oh, well, we think you, you, know, you either make WBBL a bit shorter or why should we bother playing in it? I'll just take a break I'll, and I'll say, you know, I'm having a break for my mental health and the ball can't do anything about it at that point. I think that if they, if they are, if they really do want to make it shorter for me and they just, they should just reduce it to seven games, the same as the, as the, the, the basic hundred tournament, although okay. hundred also does have that eighth game that, as we just mentioned earlier, yeah. they should so reduce, it to, it, seven, a reduce it to seven games. If you want to make, mm -hmm. then make the final stages, make the final, the final four a round robin thing. Okay. If you want to have a few more games in okay. it. Okay, that could but, work. Um, I'm, I'm really uncomfortable about 10 games where you play some, half the teams twice and half the teams only once, because you're going to inevitably wind up in a situation where you have a fight between fourth and fifth, where the fifth place side has played the top three sides the extra game, and the fourth place side has played the bottom three sides the extra game. Well, games. maybe, but... It's no, going to happen. Okay. I think that um, something else you were saying earlier, Sid, is that we do like our jiggery pokering around with these franchise competitions, don't we? And we don't seem to mind, or the, the boards seem to think that it's worth every year introducing some new new twist or increasing the length or decreasing the length or that kind of thing and it, you know it's like WBBL last year was it last year with the first time that we had the challenger and the eliminator and the 
there's something else. And the power surge. Oh, the power and... surge. Yeah, I've still not got my yeah, head I mean, that. They've introduced all these things, but yeah. it doesn't, doesn't appear to have helped the crowds very much. And I, now I know that ultimately it's about, it's about television. It's about how many viewers you got on television. That's yeah. what really matters. But television don't like showing games from empty stadiums. Um, as we've seen commented frequently about what's going on currently in India in the Men's World Cup. The yeah. TV broadcasters aren't wildly happy about no, the fact that the stadiums not. are all empty. Yeah. Especially with those huge stadiums over there. But actually they have been, a lot of the WBBL games this year have moved back to the bigger stadiums and they look even emptier. So it's not been a great look. And it shows that constant tweaking with the competition isn't what you know, ultimately wins you the game, so to speak. You know, look at, look at, just go back to it, but look at the football, men's football Premier League in this country. The format has basically been unchanged for mm. the last 120 years. And that's the premier sports tournament, you know, outside of the United States in the entire world. That's the way to do it. I I've think. got an answer, which is that every single match should be um, the same as the Stars v the Strikers. Um, and then um, basically you get like, uh, a semi rest day, and it's only because it's only the length of half a game. So one side has to be bowled out for exactly. <laughs> yeah, that was quite an astonishing match yesterday, wasn't it? Um, so yeah, um, the the stars all out for twenty nine in the end. Um, I believe that I've read that that is the lowest ever total by a team in a women's professional franchise competition. So that's a bit ba a bit mad. Um, it's even more crazy because it's. A t a, the, the team that holds that record, the Stars, um, I, um, and I'm presumably going to hold the record for the foreseeable future, is a team that contains both Meg Lanning and Alice Capsey. And that's just a bit mad. Um, Capsey yeah. is having a little bit of a, a troubled start, perhaps, to WBBL life this time. Well, a little bit, I think. But I mean, it did get specifically called out by Julia Price and Mel Jones on commentary yeah. in the second game because she came in and got out a couple of balls later and... Um, and Julia Price and Mel Jones basically said, oh, you know, really, she needs to learn that there's nothing wrong with, you know, taking a couple of balls. She, she comes in and tries to go from ball one, and that's her kind of USP, but she should have taken a couple of balls because there. Because at that point, they were already they, two they, wickets they, down yeah. for not very many, yeah. Uh, but, you know, that, that is the way she plays. And it's true that, you know, it means that you have big highs and big lows with Capsie. Yeah. But I actually went back and looked at the, her England record over the last, you know, two years since she made her debut. And she's put in match-winning performances for England on six occasions since... I went back to, right to 2020. Uh, Alice Capsie, since 2020, has put in match-winning performances on six occasions. Now, bear in mind, she only started playing in 2022. Yeah. Since 2020, Heather Knight and Tammy Beaumont I've only put in match-winning performances on seven occasions each. How are you, so defining, Capsi's... How are you defining match-winning performance? Oh, the, 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 best batting, the best batting performance in a game that England won. Right, okay. So, so it's you know, you're, when you're the top scorer in a match, yeah, that's how you're measuring yeah. it. Okay. Um, that makes so, sense. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's crude, yeah. but it's basically, it is the case. So, yes, you know, the, 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 she will go through these little bits of low scores yeah. but as long as she keeps putting in you know six match winning performances in a you know every two years in in that kind of cycle she's doing you know better than some top top players so yeah. you know I think that she can carry on doing what she's doing and I think that you know you just have to kind of live with that from her but she'll pay you back so okay. that's what I think moving on Sid there's been another bit of um, quite uh, exciting news this week um, coming at us globally in women's cricket. Um, so, well, actually in men's cricket, um, but it involves two um, former women players because uh, Kath Dalton and Alex Hartley have been named um, as the first females to take up bowling coach roles within men's franchise cricket. Um, so they are both going to be going to work as bowling coaches with the Molten Sultans in the PSL, the Pakistan Super League. Um, and um, obviously Kath Dalton is going to be working with the fast bowlers and Alex Hartley is going to be working with the spin bowlers. Yeah, and uh, Kath Dalton is going to be a senior coach. Alex Hartley, I think, is both, I believe her role is as an assistant coach right. officially. Okay. Um, the Kath Dalton one is kind of kind of interesting. She's actually she, so she's been doing although she's she's not been a huge player, um, and you know she's she was a you know a, a sort of county regular for Essex, yeah. but never and kind she, of and made it to the, Ireland, never made it she? really to the next yeah. level. She played a handful of games for Ireland, uh, you know, after you know she. Uh, went over there rather than kind of seeking England honours. Um, 
But, you know, what she has done right from the beginning of her career, she's been involved with coaching. She's worked with a guy called Ian Pont, who's a very well-known and well-respected fast bowling coach. Yeah. Ian Pont is not everybody's cup of tea, it has to be said. There are plenty of people that um, think that, you he's know, very he's, radical, a bit, he's a bit he? bonkers. He's got some quite radical but approaches. The people, yeah. the people that, that, that he works with, that, that work with him, all are like, you know, this guy is a genius and, you know, he's got the secret to be able to, you know, he improved my bowling. He's got the secret to making me bowl five miles an hour faster. Okay. And, you know, and that's his kind of USB. And Kath Dalton's worked with him for a long time, um, you know, as his assistant. He's kind of mentored her. Yeah. She's done her coaching badges. She's got up to, she's got up to level three, I believe. Yes. So she's, she's, you know, she's only got one more to go before she yeah. makes the ultimate kind of ultimate coaching level. And she's worked, and she's a, also lot worked a lot with men in the yeah. subcontinent. So she's done a lot of work in the subcontinent and she's done a lot of work in men's mm. cricket coaching. So she's got the experience to, to kind of pull this off. Alex Hartley, that's a brave move, Alex. She, she's, she's not got a lot of coaching experience. The best they come up with her was she occasionally mentors some of the younger players. It's a bit left field, isn't it? She, has, she hasn't she's got kind of been coaching doing most experience. Of her... She hasn't got experience yeah. with coaching she's, men and working she's been with focusing men. focusing mainly on her media she, career. She hasn't got experience working in the subcontinent. Brave move. Okay, well, we'll have to see how, how they get on. I mean, I think good luck I, to her. But... I feel a bit uncomfortable about the, the process, I must admit, because the guy who's in charge there, um, everyone's kind of praising him and saying, oh, this is a really progressive move. And of course it is, um, in the sense of actually having women working coaching men, and, you know, there's no absolutely no reason why women shouldn't be doing that. Um, and I guess it's particularly radical um, maybe in, the, in, um, in Pakistan, where, um, you know, the... The, actually the idea it's still of women even playing cricket is in some quarters kind of frowned upon um so that's great but i don't want us to move from a from a, a situation whereby um whereby men are given coaching jobs um and it's a kind of jobs for the boys situation to a, a situation where women are given coaching jobs and it's jobs for the girls and that people are given coaching roles just based on like um you know kind of social media following or whatever, rather than in a kind of proper, full, transparent appointments process where everybody's able to apply and the best person is then given the job based on kind of transparent, proper criteria. Um, now, as far as I'm aware, I'm not 100% sure, but as far as I'm aware, that wasn't the case with these appointments. Um, so that just makes me a little bit uncomfortable, I have to say, about the whole thing. But anyway, good luck to both of them and we'll be watching to see how they get on. Well, we won't be actually watching the cricket because we don't really bother watching men's cricket, to be honest. We're too busy with women's cricket and it's much better. Anyway, <laughs> um, finally, Sid, um, gosh, there's been quite a lot going on this week, given that it's basically our off season. Um, and we we sat down yesterday and we're like, hmm, what are we actually going to talk about in the podcast tomorrow? Anyway, um, this week there has been quite an important meeting at ECB HQ at Lords in London. Um, the representatives um, of the PCA, the English Professional Cricketers Association, um, both men's and women's, went to the ECB and they had a two-day kind of summit with the big wigs, um, including Beth Barrett Wild, um, who's obviously in charge of the um, of the women's hundred, um, and um, one of the Richards. Of now, one of the best, Richards was there. Oh, world. there you go. Okay. Um, so, but the, but the big topic of conversation was about the future of the hundred, which is obviously something that has been um, discussed quite a lot, um, and is uh, kind of on the ECB's agenda at the moment as to what on earth they do with this um, competition that on the one hand has been incredibly successful, particularly for women's cricket, and on the other hand is like loathed by a substantial proportion of the, the cricketing public, unfortunately. Um, so yeah. And loathed by a substantial proportion of the, you know, the cricketing professionals, to be honest, because yes. the, you know, anybody that's, that's not you know, raking in the money from it is, is not happy about it. So you've got you know, 10 counties that are not happy about it. You've got a load of players exactly. and administrators that are not happy about it. So anyway, so, what did they decide, Raph? Well, well, I don't think anything's little, been decided, little, 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 but um, little bits and bobs there was a, out, yeah, there was a, the proposals there was, are. There was a report on BBC Sport um, about some of the things that have been discussed. And it's quite interesting because it reads to me like the men came along and said this and the women came along over here and said this and they're quite far apart in their perspectives and their views on it. So the men want it to be, um, there's certainly a proposal on the table for it to actually be an eight, a full 18 county competition. Um, so you would have each of the 18 counties would put forward a team who would play the 100 ball format. 
Um, and then, of course, you would then have to have promotion and relegation between two divisions, um, et cetera, et cetera. So it would fundamentally alter the nature of the 100. But as you say, it's quite unpopular at the moment because a lot of the men's counties don't get a look in. Um, yeah, they've been given a substantial amount of money by the ECB um, to, to kind of look the other way and, um, and pretend that they were OK with it and vote it through initially. But now that it's come down to the crunch, they're looking at it and going, oh, actually, this is quite a big deal and we'd quite like to be involved in it and we don't feel that yeah, we are. We did take all that money, but yeah. uh, the pay actually... <laughs> <laughs> can we no. keep that money and also yeah. change the format of the yeah. <laughs> Exactly. So that's what um, some of the, the men's representatives from the PCA are saying. On the other hand, you've got the women's representatives coming along and going, hang on a minute, really not sure that we've actually got a deep enough player pool at the moment to support an 18-team professional competition. We've only got eight regions with, and the eight regions don't even have full professional setups at the moment. Um, you know, they're still at a situation where like at least five or six of the players in each region are uh, having to juggle their cricket with um, with other work and with study, etc. So we don't even have we don't even have eight professional teams, and you're trying to tell us that we need to have eighteen. Where on earth are we going to get all the, those resources from? Yeah, and, and where's, all the, of those where's the money going to come from to exactly. fund this? Because that's the other thing that there's not going to be any more money. Yeah, right. You can go. Oh, Oh, but the, each 100 team is getting, you know, whatever it is, two million pounds a year. So obviously all 18 new 100 teams yeah. should also get two million pounds a year. No, there isn't the money to do that. Yeah. That money just doesn't exist. Sky are not going to put their hands down. Oh, I'll tell you what, lads, I'm Mr. Sky here. I'm going to throw some more money. <laughs> you have some more money, more money, more money. No, that's not how it works. Okay. Um, and so you need to appreciate that that. You know, that money is going to therefore be spread much more thinly. And again, in the mm -hmm. women's game, it's going to mean, you know, players, if, if you're doubling the number of teams as they're talking about, that means if you're currently earning 30,000 from the 100 and, you know, making a decent chunk that will, you know, help you through the rest of the year when you're perhaps earning a bit less, you know, suddenly that's going to be 15,000 because we've got to pay all the other players. Yeah. What about salaries in the men's 100? If the top players are earning like, what is it, 120k or something and, and the England men still can't be bothered to turn up and play in it. So are you are they they're then going to accept that they're going to be paid half of that? Yeah, I think apparently, they, apparently they're not going to accept that because that's the reason why the ECB won't raise the salaries in the women's 100 because the men refuse to accept having their salaries lowered. Anyway, it's a big mess. Um, the, other, the other point of discussion was apparently that a lot of the women um, reps of the PCA, who are obviously representing the views of the whole women's game, are saying, well, hang on a minute. Um, if you do promotion and relegation, what happens to double headers? The, the very model which has been so successful in the 100 in terms of actually getting people to turn up and watch the women's game. Um, and that's, it's, you know, it's a good question. And it's one that, again, because so much of the conversation around the hundred is focused exclusively on men's cricket, people just bypass that question. They don't, they don't um, engage with that as a as a dilemma. So, do you actually attach the results of the men's and the women's teams together? So you make it so that the um, if you're getting promoted, you're getting promoted based on the results of both your men and your women, and the same with relegation. Um, that would actually be a genuinely well, interesting concept it, it in could terms be. of like it, binding the two it sides could together. Be, but it doesn't seem to be one that anyone is actually talking about seriously. So if you are going to have promotion and relegation, then that needs to be something that you bear in mind. Anyway, Absolutely. big big conversations have been had, and it'll be really interesting to see what comes yeah, out. Yeah, and it is that's perhaps the most interesting thing that these conversations are going on. Yeah. And you know, ultimately, what will this mean for regional cricket, which is also being talked about at the moment? Yeah, that yeah. is a very big question, Sid. <laughs> well, maybe maybe one that we can talk about in future episodes. Point. Yes, when we know a little bit more about what might happen with it. Great. Okay, well, let's go back and watch some WBBL, Sid. Quick. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for, for tuning in. Today. Bye. Bye.